Cheers, guys. Hey, cheers, cheers Hillary. Thanks for having me um, and taking the time to get a drink. You guys have both been in the automotive industry for decades with AEV and as a designer, and these successful careers have led to a very full life with uh, an array of endeavors. And the two of you, as a couple, I have to say are a force. <laughs> but since we're at your winery and your, your vineyard, I want to talk about buy a, a state wine first. And um, what are you sipping on? Well, I'll take this one. This is a very unique product. Um, since we are in the pizzeria business as well with Bigalora Wood for Cucina, we wanted to do a, a wine that's best paired with pizza. And in Italy, that's Lambrusco. We can't really make a Lambrusco in the state of Michigan, but we can make a Lambrusco-like wine. And so it's a chilled, sparkling red wine, pretty dry. And it pairs perfectly with um, a, like a thin crust charcoal. Mm. Well, we also were thinking, you know, I mean, it's hard to make a very big, bold, juicy red in northern Michigan, as you, I'm sure, are aware of. And um, there are certain people that will, you know, it just takes a lot to try and get there, and I feel like you never quite get there. Um, so this was also a creative way to use an otherwise, like, very light red varietal mm -hmm. where people might pick it up and go, like, oh, this is kind of too light, and I was expecting something more bold. You know, this is truly like a Lambrusco-style grape, so it's a lighter thing, it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. And I think the stigma of Lambrusco, because there used to be a stigma of Lambrusco when it was a sugar bomb that, you know, our grandparents had at a American-Italian restaurant. Um, I, I think that stigma is kind of, it's been a, it's run its course. Mm. It's been a long enough period of time between the two. And the other thing that's unique about this one is there's a grape varietal um, called Marquette. And it's a hybrid varietal that was developed in Minnesota for those cold, frigid winters. And there's a couple of acres planted of Marquette here in Northport. So we were able to secure some fruit in 2019 to make this product. Mm. So there's 77 acres here. I'm curious to have you speak to the northern Michigan wine scene. What makes it special? I mean, of course, in particular, what makes Bio Wine special? Well, um, it's a special site. It's it's a pretty unique site for Leelanau County. I mean, uh, we've, walked, we've walked and researched sites for 15 to 20 years, I think, before we settled on one. And to get this much topography with that kind of view, not, in, not just the water, but the, all the, the trees and the county view in the background, it's, it's pretty unique. Well, also like being on the 45th parallel, you know, you're in good company with a lot of other places in the world that are wine regions. Yeah. Um, and although the climate isn't exactly the same, uh, you know, you have a relatively uh, comparable situation with sun and weather. Yeah, and, we, and we, being that we're in the northern Italian food business, we wanted to make northern Italian mm -hmm. style wines, mm -hmm. which you can do in Leelanau County. Mm -hmm. You can't make every kind of wine in Leelanau County, but you mm -hmm. can make northern European style wines very well. So that's what we're targeting. That's the grape varieties that we've planted, and that's what we're going after. But the, the, the vineyards up here have come a long way in a short amount of time. Mm. And I think that the, the romantic notion of getting married at a vineyard has helped push that along. Not only just people's passion about producing an interesting product or a very good product. Yeah. Um, I think the product has come leaps and bounds from where it started. I mean, Sam's dad planted in the 70s, I think. Um, earlier than that and uh, and uh, there's there's a lot of farmland up here you know this the where we're sitting used to be a cherry orchard okay. um, and I think like farming is so integral to this part of the of the country in this part of, of the state of Michigan and uh, to see cherry trees pushed over or apple trees pushed over and orchards in general just kind of not being used this is an interesting like adaptive reuse of that land. Um, I think that there's obviously with each fruit that you would grow there's a different set of circumstances and what makes this property super unique is what like what Chet mentioned earlier is the kind of peaks and valleys in here uh -huh. and it's really important um, specifically in the spring and in the fall when you get a frost mm. and it basically allows the wind to take the frost into the valleys and away from the grapes. Oh, so you'll notice yeah. when, we, when if we would walk the property in a valley situation, you wouldn't have any grapes yeah, you because they would be trapping the frost. Because literally, literally you, can have, you can have fruit in one spot and five feet away, you can have no fruit because huh. of the weather's different. 
Wow. Yeah, that's really, it's remarkable because of these troughs down here. We've got all the cold air funneling down in the trough and falling down towards that brown barn over there. So we get, we, you know, get a lot of that cold, cold mm. weather out of the, out of the growing cycle. And then of course, what's behind us over here is all majority of that south facing. So you get the sun right. and it rolls way down into the valley down there. So we're very happy with the site. And obviously we need to get it kicked in gear and <laughs> get a little event space up here, some yeah, sort of venue. Okay. Yeah. So Chet, I know you're on the Michigan Craft Beverage Council. What is something that people might not know about Michigan's agricultural products that go into making all the well, it's, wine what, and cider and beer? Yeah, what I'm that? learning is just how, how big it is. It's a huge industry and it means so much to the state for tourism and agro-tourism and, and the, you know, drinking the products and, you know, it's just, yeah, I've met a lot of great people on the council so far and just learning a lot about, you know, the different industries that it's supporting. I mean, we're, we also grow hops up here mm -hmm. in Leelanau and, you know, it's crazy to think, I think yesterday I got a list of microbrews in Michigan at something like 493, wow. just, just nuts. Mm -hmm. Just trying to contact that many people in a year. It's pretty tough. Yeah, right. Now, how did you guys land in Northport as residents? That's his. That's his <laughs> question. <laughs> well, well, I think I think I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think as a child we used to camp at Timber Shores. Oh. Yep. And then my first time as an adult, I remember a buddy of mine called from Grand Rapids and he said, "Hey, let's meet in Traverse City for the weekend. We're gonna spend the North. We're gonna spend the Fourth up at Northport. What's Northport?" So we got on his boat in Traverse City. We bombed up to the coast. We pulled into the marina at Northport. He said, go into town and grab a six pack of beer and a bag of ice. And so I walked into town and I'm like, okay, I'm all about this. So if, would it have been a deal breaker if Kyle couldn't imagine a life up here? <laughs> I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think it was a hard to twist my arm no. in that category. I mean, I think the one thing that is like super, I mean, there's so many great things about Northern Michigan that a lot of people, even in Southeast Michigan, don't realize. And I think the, the treasure of Lelano County, I mean, you have, of course, the food and the wine scene that the farm to table that has been uh, elevated in the last decade or so, but also just the natural beauty is so intense. I mean, uh, all the sand dunes and the, the west coast of the peninsula that go all the way down to Sleeping Bear. Northport is the only place where you can enjoy a hike on the sand dune in a sunset and drive for five minutes and be three miles across and in a marina on a boat on the big lake. And that's what makes the wine growing site so unique is that it's, we're so close and so surrounded uh -huh. by water. Right. And so if, it, you know, if we have some heat build up in the water over the summer, we can retain that heat through the early fall to get the fruit a little bit sweeter. But, you know, on the reverse side in the spring, if it's super, super cold and the lake is super, super cold, we, we don't it have takes that. a long time yeah, to get things going. Yeah, so Kyle, I know you are a CCS alumni yes. um, and your uh, design, um, full service design consultancy, you specialize in automotive design, but mm -hmm. also industrial mm -hmm. and um, interior mm -hmm. and transportation design. So how does Northern Michigan influence your creativity? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity here because it's a bit of a blank slate. Mm. Um, when you're looking at things that I design, cars, buildings, restaurants, hospitality experience, um, it's pretty young here. Uh, so I think that there's an opportunity there to really let the design, whatever it might be, architecture, be very, um, have a very symbiotic relationship with where it's mm. placed um, and and really start to you, you kind of create that history and I think it's important to create designs that are going to stand the test of time not only construction wise but aesthetic wise um, and I think that this place is so far behind the trend that you're not going to be building anything trendy um, but I think it's important uh, to be to find out the history and the story about what it is that you're tackling before okay. you tackle it. Um, and I think like I've learned a few lessons from some projects uh, that I wasn't involved in that might not have gone so well where um, an architect, a builder, the whole team of people that would construct this thing, 
came in from out of state or came in from out of the area and didn't use the materials that are available here, the labor that's available here, um, and take advantage of the site that they're on. I mean, uh -huh. something as simple as if you're designing a restaurant, you're not going to put windows on that side, you're going to put windows on this side. Right. Um, I know that sounds stupid, but it happens a lot. Huh, interesting. Now, what's your design process when you're not on that site? Where would we find you working? And mm. I work all the time. <laughs> it doesn't look like I'm working all the time, but um, most designers are very critical people. And so when you think they're maybe being cynical, it's they're processing things and absorbing things and looking at things and saying how you would do things differently or w how mm -hmm. you would approach things differently. And um, I mean, lucky for me, I get to travel around all over the place and my work can travel with me. And I think COVID definitely helped because before COVID, we were already working remotely. And so sometimes you'd video conference in or you'd conference call in and you were looked down upon for that. And so now I'm kind of like, I told you. <laughs> right, now everyone's doing it. Yeah, now everybody's doing it. But I, I think that the design process, it's it starts from before you're even thinking about what you're gonna do. Mm. Um, and How do you get inspired? Like is there anywhere you, besides, I mean, coming up here, I feel like you could come up here to get inspired, but um, what do you do to get inspired if you need to, like, uh, Well, get travel, 100%. I think the more of the world that you can see, the more you're going to be exposing yourself. And as much mm -hmm. as the internet has brought the world to your fingertips, I mean, it doesn't bring experience. Um, it doesn't bring, you know, the roads here are amazing, for example. Mm -hmm. If you want to talk a, about it on, like, an automotive sense, the roads on the on the peninsula here nobody knows about them and you get on them and you just get these like beautiful country roads on days with rolling hills and you know there's plenty of other parts of the world that have a very similar but different experience and um you know travel to me is the way to do it mm. now chat with aev american expedition vehicles um you know you're so highly respected in the world of um off-road performance creating kits and products for Jeeps and more, and I see AEV all around town up here. Um, what would you tell someone who has a business idea and wants to bring it to life? Because you also, I mean, there's and more of, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Bigalora and Arbor Brewing Company. You have many ventures, so I'm curious what you tell people when. Well, it's interesting. I'll tell you the story about AEV. My, my business partner, um, it was a thesis competition that he won his senior year at college in um, Missoula. Missoula, Montana. Huh. So he won a $20,000 grant and he started the business. So, and it's pretty wow. much what he started doing was pretty much what we do today, but just on a lot grander mm -hmm. scale. Sure. And um, I would imagine when, I, so when opportunities come your way um, and when you're managed, when you're involved in so many different endeavors, how do you know when to pursue an opportunity? <laughs> and what are the questions you ask yourself? Um, and what's that decision-making process? Well, we're you know we're spread pretty thin right now, so we're not looking for a lot of new opportunities. Right. But um, but it's it you know, a lot of it, and I'll just be honest with you, a lot of it is is the right place at the right time, timing, luck. Timing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will tell you something different. That they're genius and they're brilliant and. Not really. It's like, it's a lot of it is right place, right time, sure. right people, right team. Right team. I mean, I think there's a lot of vetting and as, as lucky as we have been with most everything that we've done, um, there's always been a person, a couple of people where we can throw out, Chet and I can brainstorm and throw out ideas all day long and be as creative as we want to be. There's always somebody to be like, hmm. I don't know about that one, guys. And then we have to be, you know, respectful enough to say, okay, that person knows what they're doing. Um, and I, we're willing to take that advice and not take that risk and mm -hmm. move on and move on to the next crazy idea and spit 10 more crazy ideas out before somebody says, hey, I think we could do this. Yeah. And is it, yeah, how do you assess risk? And is it a lot of times a feeling or is it like obviously oh, numbers, a little bit of everything? Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. This, this, Doing this was kind of a no-brainer for us because we were in the restaurant business. We were mm -hmm. consuming wine. So to have us at Baya State in Northport make our own house wines, you know, we, it was a natural, right? We, we knew as we add stores how much wine we're consuming and, 
you know, as this thing matures, it's going to make way more wine than we need um, at our restaurants. But hopefully by then we'll have an established clientele mm -hmm. network of distribution yeah. at stores and other restaurants. So I know you've each had your, you know, individual projects. And then when you do come, when you work together on a project, I'm curious to know if there's a secret to working with a partner. Like what's mm, some tips to... A lot of arguing. <laughs> <laughs> what's the key to working with a significant other? That's a very good question. Well, I think it's that that um, as a creative person, you tend to like your own ideas, you know? <laughs> so um, I think the key is keeping an open mind. Hmm. And when something comes up that you might otherwise scoff off or be like, that's the opposite of my idea and my idea is the most important idea, is to sit back and actually think about it and analyze it and say, okay, well, if it is indeed a bad idea, you have reason to reason to back that up yeah, um, and, and, and or move on with a new suggestion. And the combined the combined product is always better. Yeah. Yes. Than one individual's right. yes. you know, execution thoughts, concept and execution versus the combined effort. Whether you're working with a couple together, or you're working with a whole sure. team of people. Yeah. But I also think that our areas of expertise are different. And so we can rely on each other in our areas of separate areas of expertise to land on an answer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one might weigh heavily on this end of it and the other on this end of it and they come together and sometimes in a pretty symbiotic relationship. So this actually is tees up my next question <laughs> perfectly because, you know, for fun, what would you each, what can you each say that you admire about each other um, as it relates to the, just, I don't know, in life, Overall, but and specifically in business, like if you know to to brag for a second, and you know what's something that just like stands out about each other. Well, I would say about Chet that um, he has an ability to uh, listen to everybody and not be the you know loud guy in the room. He's the the kind of silent giant. You know, he can step back and kind of analyze what's going on and very clearly and concisely without a lot of emotion express an idea or thought. Um, and I think he's very underrated. I think when he walks into the room, there's some people that know who he is, um, but he's not walking into the room like I'm the boss. He's walking into the room like I'm part of this team and we're going to make this work. Do you, did you, did you agree? <laughs> I guess. But uh, I think the, the, I, the thing I like about so nice. Kyle in working with them or just being in a relationship with them is the fact that, you know, as a creative person and everyone is, kind of says, okay, creative people are kind of sloppy and not well organized. Well, Kyle's, Kyle can be very well organized. Mm. So when we're getting stuff together on our own or for yeah. our office or for yeah. our homes, you know, it, Kyle can go in and, you know, really get things tuned up and everything but in the right place and nice works really well would you agree with that statement for the most part <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you each consider a, a big break in your career or just a pivotal moment that really changed the trajectory of your careers mm, I mean the when I met my partner Dave out in uh, Vegas at this trade show called SEMA pretty pivotal. We just formed a relationship at first and then we were just friends and we helped each other out on projects. And then we had, you know, as things got tighter and tighter, we ended up partnering on the, on the larger scale company. That was pretty, a pretty big one. And then as far as AEV is concerned, um, our partnership with General Motors was a big, big turn for yeah, us. Wow. Because we really only did stuff on our own. We never did anything for a major automaker. Now with mm. General Motors, we're doing things for them. So, but I think you winding down Quality Metalcraft in terms yeah, of are... getting ready to sell it allowed a lot of um, other interesting things where your energy and effort and expertise could be brought into. And there's there's a little hunger there that's great. Like he said, we're spread a little thin right now. But I think that turning point might have been as quality Melcraft is going out the door, there's all these new, it's not like retire and peace out to Sarasota. It's like, okay, we're staying here. You know, we're figuring out different things. We're figuring out where to invest and keep ourselves busy and staying busy. Mm -hmm. I think if you ask me the question about what would pivot, I would say it would be getting out of the automotive industry mm. in general, because- Well, the Detroit hustle. The Detroit, yeah, the uh. Detroit, 
again, it's different after COVID, but the Detroit, you know, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. grind. And um, as a creative person, you're going to art school, right? I went to CCS, you go to art school. And even though I graduated in industrial design, which is a very practical application of design, um, the idea that you're going to work in a structure that's a militaristic based structure that's basically corporate America and you're treated no differently than a non-creative person. Um, it's a little daunting. And I think sure. leaving that, leaving those shackles was a turning point for me. Like once I stepped out the door, I was like, I should have done this a long time. Ago. Well, and it's crazy too, that it took, that's only could happen in Detroit and the Detroit automakers, right? It took a global pandemic to say it's okay to work from home. Mm. You know, that's a, mm -hmm. if you worked from home in Detroit 10 years ago, you were a slacker. Mm. If you took your vacation time, you were right. a slacker. Right. So it's like, <laughs> you know, finally, the you know, large number of those people are never going back or they're gonna have ultimate flexibility, go as much as they want, stay home as much as they want. So would you say that you have a good work-life balance uh, because you're able to, you know, see the benefits and, you know, make, Put it, make it a priority to, you know, live where you want to live and be around nature while also still working in industries that might yeah, not be yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, think we're lucky, very lucky in the sense that every everything that we're involved with, we have such great team members, like people that are responsible for it so that we don't have to be responsible day to day and the trust that exists between everyone and the way that it works in the open communication, if, if that didn't exist, mm. we would be working so much that we wouldn't be able to enjoy life. Mm. Um, so I could go down a whole rabbit hole of questions of team building and all of that. But um, the last thing I do want to touch on as it relates to, to business is was there a piece of business advice that you received along the way that really stuck with you? Oh, I got a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my dad, my these dad, aren't big Al jokes. My, my, my dad was famous for this stuff. And one of them that is, two of them that really, really guided is uh, you can be the dumbest guy in the room, but you don't have to open your mouth and let everyone know how dumb you are. <laughs> and number two is once you start believing your own bullshit, you're in trouble. Oh my God, I love that. I'm gonna print those out as quotes. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I, I've, watched so it, I've watched it happen, both accounts. I've That's watched it happen so, so many times. That's so, so many good. Times. Kyle, do you have something that's, uh, that sticks uh, out? So yeah, much? a really good friend of mine um, told me, uh, you know, always charge. Mm. You know, you know what you're worth and don't do favors, you know, do your work. Love that. So, such good advice. Um, I know you have a warm weather retreat down in Miami. Um, it's been featured in the Wall Street Journal. Your home here in Northport has been highlighted multiple times in publications. Is there a through line in, in everything, in the spaces you create together? Yeah, in terms of functionality, 100%. Mm. I think that like once you're with someone for a certain amount of time or once you're in a certain place for a certain amount of time, those two factors are giant in terms of like a protocol for design or a common thread. I mean, Chet's an amazing cook, um, loves to cook. And so we kind of have like a, a kitchen lay. It's not a layout, but like, you know, you know where your priorities are, you know, like, you know, those certain sets of things how that make your life very enjoyable that you would want to implement in any of your homes mm -hmm. or any of your living places for sure. Mm -hmm. And now, aside from successful businesses, you're part of the community, you give back, your um, foundation events sell out around town. I would love to hear the, the mission behind the Michael Chikuti it's, Foundation. It's, it's really, really simple. It's about visibility and it's about just getting it out there, the message for the gay community that, you know, we're not going anywhere. We, we want to be visible. We want to be accepted. Mm. Mm. And, and, it's, and it's really, it's all about the next generation because we, if we can save one life, from some kid not getting tormented in high school oh. or something like that. Well, but I think it's even broader than that. I think um, obviously there's a there's a big uh, 
portion of the proceeds that go to the gay community, the LGBTQ community, um, and we're activists, I would say, in that community in that sense. But the Michael Cicutti Foundation reaches out much further than that. Um, when we do, uh, specifically in Northport, we've given a lot of money to the Northport Promise, which I think is, is pretty similar to the... Kalamazoo yeah. Promise or something, okay. um, it's, which is a program that that uh, supports college education for Northport students. And um, when we used to do some charity events at Cherry Basket here, one of the one of the coolest parts about them, not, these aren't like huge fundraisers, um, but we would pick three local charities. And what was important is that the charities were local. Um, and so we would pick three local charities and let the guests choose, you know, vote on the charities and then, then the, you know, winner takes all, I guess. Well, that's so great. Um, I know that I've attended one of the dinners. Um, so these, you know, they're, they're wonderful dinner parties, raising money. And then, you know, another joy of Northern Michigan is entertaining friends and family, which kind of brings me back to food. Um, and I'm curious, um, to just get your thoughts on the local farm to table movement and well it's de it's definitely gotten better over the last 10 years and it's um i mean it's a pretty special place to live from traverse city all the way up to the tip um unbelievable food options and it's the seasonality of it is just fantastic granted we're only here from early spring to late fall but you know what we get in that time frame i mean you couldn't pick a better place to live and what are some of the, like the what ingredients do you guys find yourself? Well, we, we start we, we, we start at the beginning foraging. Yeah, it all starts with mushrooms. Mushrooms and ramps. Yeah, and yeah. then the farm market starts, and yeah. then it's basically that I gave up on gardening because the farm market is so good. <laughs> right. that why would I want to do what the local farmers can do so much better than I can? So when, whatever comes in every Friday, that's what we cook. So when, when there's asparagus, we only eat asparagus. When there's corn, we only eat corn. When there's strawberries, we only eat strawberries. So it's like you know, and it's a great season. It's a wonderful season. Great products. But I think it's also, um, you know, that's all. it goes beyond the farmer's market. You know, we have local friendships that we've established for protein, for chicken, for pork. Um, you know, it, like kind of everything we cook. I mean, obviously we're not, we're not getting scallops out of the bay, but, um, you know, most ingredients that we eat during the summer and the, the seasons that we're here are, are as local as we yep. can get them. Man, it's... A a magical place to live it really is um, on the note of community and gathering how would you describe the community in Leelanau County well I think it's it's closer than most people think the the best evidence to me of that is in Northport at music in the park so you get there when you get there early every Friday <laughs> the music is irrelevant I would say you would you I mean the music is there for you to be enjoyed yep. it's not irrelevant it's just that um it's such it's a community gathering yes the exactly that's a way better way to put it is that you can have everybody that you wanted to have over for dinner all summer long in one location <laughs> at one time um and make an effort to talk or not or whatever meet up and I I, I think that sense of community is is very mm -hmm. strong yeah and we were really always too caught up with too much going on at home to go to music in the park and it's only been this last year and a half that we've ever even done it oh. but now we kind of we kind of pretty strict about going on Fridays yeah I know it's like everyone has their spots mm -hmm. and um, well we've spent the last 15 years inviting people to our place to fall in love with this place and now they're all moving up here, so we don't need to have dinner parties anymore. <laughs> right, you're on your own now. Have yeah. us over. <laughs> exactly. It's your turn. <laughs> and I suppose I, uh, a nice way to wrap, I have a fun quick fire game to play, but um, what excites you most about the happenings in Northport? Oh, I mean, it's it's exciting times for Northport without a doubt. I mean, we, we were around in the early 2000s when, you know, Northport was worthless. It was absolutely worthless. The mistakes made on the sewer system and property values and you know everyone was Sutton's Bay, Leland and go back home they'd never come up here now it's like they're coming up by well I think a lot of places are getting crowded um, it's gonna take a lot for Northport to get crowded uh, it still has that charm and there's a lot of things that are changing hands with big promises being made um, and I think that 
where we are as a village with our town council and all of our council members and uh, our zoning and all the government institutions that are in there that in the past I would say have been roadblocks mm. um, are now very open-minded uh, bunch of individuals that are willing to listen to alternatives to what currently exists. So that, that in and of itself is a giant, giant change for Northport. But I also think that most of the new things that are happening there, people realize that they can't just open a business. We have to have a plan. We have to have a bigger plan. And that plan has to be sustainable for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, everyone from the dishwasher to the, you know, multi-gazillionaire that happens to have a house or whatever. It needs right. to be, things need to be accessible and, um, and, and they need to work mm -hmm. as a whole. Yeah. So I think that the community of Northport understands that and hopefully it won't be this empty promise of like a revitalization. Sure. Well, that sounds hopeful. So I have a quick rapid fire game. So in one, it's just like a yes or no or one sentence answer. Um, what's your favorite month in Northern Michigan? September. August. Oh, okay. Sunrise or sunset? sunset. Oh, sunset. <laughs> sunset. I could that one. Don't ask guy. Mario that question. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I know, because I'm kind of a sunrise <laughs> yeah, girl yeah, myself. Yeah, exactly. um, Northern Michigan's best kept secret. Oh, oh God. Fisher's I don't Happy wanna... Hour Tavern. <laughs> <laughs> What's your order there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely uh, the navy bean soup with ham. It's one of the best things. And they're, don't they, they're raspberry pie? Or... That's, that's, that's the like pies a, are you're, amazing. You're lucky to get a slice of that, because it's so short a season, and they make so few of them. All right. What about for you, Kyle? Mm, I don't even want to say it. <laughs> I think Northern Michigan's best kept secret is Pyramid Point. Ah, amazing view. Uh, favorite restaurant? Uh, I got to tell you, um, Ren in Sutton's Bay is mm -hmm. absolutely hitting it out of the park. Unbelievable, world class food, great people, mm. great menu. I love sitting on that back patio. Or the front patio, or inside. Yes. <laughs> I know, I went there in March, and like, now I'm kind of going off a little bit, but to your point of the, the foraging, it's like March and April it was foraging, and then it was an, it allowed me the chance to go to these, some of these restaurants when it's not so busy in the summer, summer months. Um, yeah, it's special being up here in those kind of off months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay, what's your favorite restaurant? Well, if I wasn't going to say Wren, um, <laughs> I wish I could say Alliance. <laughs> come um, back. Yeah, come back, please. Um, I, I'm going to help you at Farm Club. Yeah, I mean, again, it's getting all the press, so I'm trying to be a little bit more inventive about that. I guess it's about to be not the best kept secret but i would say farm club yeah okay all right and the number one out outdoor activity we'll see you guys doing oh it's got to be the hikes for me 100 okay. percent. Yep. Okay. yeah we'd be we do it two three times a week nice. in these state parks well cheers guys i could chit chat forever this was cheers. so fun cheers to awesome. northport yep. <laughs>